Survival is all about, okay, mental toughness. It's probably 80% of mental exercise and only 20% of physical exercise. No matter where you are in the world, the Arctic, the desert, the jungle, the sea, it's always the same, protection, location, acquisition, navigation. There are many materials we can use to stash the shelter. Grasses, rushes, even mud. Clearing areas to land helicopters, um, we cut in trees all the time. I put a pebble in the centre of my plastic sheet, I've tied it around to form an anchor point, and I've suspended it from a convenient branch. And they passed the port around and all the other drinks, you know what I mean? It was compulsory. Lofty, how are you, brother? Yeah, Jamie and Chris, yeah. <laughs> oh, Lofty, I'm I'm just massively honoured again that you've come back on the show. Uh, we, we had a chat the other day. Friends, we'll put a link below for my first chat with Lofty. We did the other day. We chatted all about survival, really. And it's been, um, in all the time we've been podcasting, which is about four years now, We've never had so many people ask, Chris, could you please get this guest back on the show? <laughs> um, friends, um, um, John Lofty Wiseman, former SAS trooper, later went on to become an icon of all of our childhoods because he wrote the SAS Survival Handbook and did a whole host of TV shows, series, et cetera, et cetera, um, that really helped us kids, you know, get out there in the nature, get a knife, learn a few skills, pretend pretend we know what we're doing. We probably set fire to a few things that we shouldn't have done, but, you know, hey-ho. And as I, as I say, John, you know, I've never had such great, great feedback on a podcast. It's so kind you've come back on. <laughs> And I, I think the public, uh, are, are what I call our wonderful friends out there, um, would would like to know more about your time in the SAS. Um, and you were, and I'm just going to quote off, off Wikipedia here, your commanding officer said, Lofty is a legend in this regiment. <laughs> I thought you'd call me a legend, to tell you the truth, Chris. <laughs> And let's not uh, let's oh, I was a legend in my own nephew break yeah <laughs> hey mate we uh, I'll tell everyone we're born legends and we die legends it's in that middle bit you've got to realize you're a legend don't you you know we get one life it's a beautiful life there's so much out there to uh, to enjoy I, I I say this a lot and I mean no disrespect to our young people but if you're sat inside sat in the dark playing Xbox, you know, playing so that's great for a boring, you know, half hour or whatever. But what you don't want to do is get to the ripe young age of lofty and look back at your life and think, oh, do you know what? Like, I actually just sat in a dark room, play, uh, you know, none, none of my dreams come true. So, again, I'm talking too much, lofty. I am aware of that. I, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just absolutely over the bloody moon. Um, you know, it is just such an honour um, to have a childhood hero and, and you've been kind enough to come on the show twice. So in no particular order, how are you, sir, anyway? Yeah, champion, champion. Good. Yeah. St still smashing it? Still taking the pills, yeah. yeah. Do what still, I'm told. Still pulling the birds? <laughs> I, I couldn't pull a ligament at the moment, mate. <laughs> Um, first question, mate, just off the top of my head, did you ever, you, you know, a lot of us X forces have had problems with the old, you know, substances and alcohol and the reintegrate into society. And I've written, you know, books about my, uh, um, books about my, my struggles, hopefully to inspire and help other service personnel. I didn't tell you this, John. I'm actually been nominated for Veteran of the Year. <laughs> Good boy, lovely. <laughs> yes, under the category of in inspiration at the uh, English Veterans Award. So, um, what, I, I, I don't care about me, mate. What what I care about is if like if if anything I can say or do can can help someone who might be struggling. 
um, yeah. then then that's all, that's all I want. You know, I don't I don't need any awards for it. Um, but did you struggle with a booze at all? I mean, he's a, I mean, old um, Paddy Main. He was like big on the old whiskey and stuff, wasn't he? Yeah, um, we used to drink uh, every opportunity. Uh, every opportunity, really, Chris. You know, uh, we went four months with nothing, and when we come out, we had to give it a drop, and um, we had saved up maybe four months' money. And in two weeks' time, he was back in the sticks again, and no way he was going to leave any money behind. So we we spent it on well, ninety nine percent on wine, women, and song. And like I say, we wasted the rest, like. But finally, about oh thirty thirty odd year ago, I, I gave up drinking for health reasons. The wife was going to kill me, basically, Chris. So um, no more drinks. And, yeah, uh, there's I'm on a lesson. Pills now. Yeah, there's a lesson was, for all of us there, mate. And now, uh, you know, it, it, it's great when you're young, but yeah, is a time I could, like, I could live, I'm better living without it, you know. But at the time, as a kid, well, it was your duty in the army to drink, you had to, you had to attend parades and parties, and and they passed a port around and all the other drinks, you know what I mean? It was compulsory. I was forced to drink, Chris, you know, and uh, I didn't take much encouragement, mind, you know, but um. As you get older, like I say, um, taking pills and that, uh, they didn't mix. And I'm better without it, you know. I like me driving. I would hate to lose my licence, you know. And, um, yeah, so I can remember what I'm doing now most of the time. And yeah. I'm responsible yeah. for my actions. Yeah, I find the old drinking, it ruins your chances in, in F1. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Too right. Lofty, what can you tell us about Murbat? Is it the Battle of Murbat? I've, I've, I've had to be doing my research because some of our friends out there said, Chris, could you please ask Lofty about the Battle of Murbat? And I'm, I'm, I'm gathering this was during the Dofar Rebellion in Oman. I'm just reading off the screen here. Communist guerrillas from South Yemen. This is yeah, basically, like, we, we just had the 50th the 50th anniversary of Murbat. And so 50 years ago, like in Oman, Dofar, the southern Oman, uh, the lads were deployed in a place called Murbat. It's on the coast um, from our base. We was in Salala. And um, we had guys on the ground there um, with a gun crew and a 25-pounder gun. We was already, we'd just done four months. We are ready to come home. Uh, we had about three days to run, and th that was B Squadron. And G Squadron come on the ground to relieve us. And um, Murbat was attacked by 400 Adu. Adu was the enemy, you know, and um, they got together and they, they reckoned there was about 400. They attacked uh, Murbat early morning. We was getting ready to, um, well, I was the SQMS getting the ammunition ready for G squad and go on the range to uh, zero in their GPMGs. And um, we got the message that Murbat was under attack. The Arif was down. The Arif is an annual wind and low mist comes in and this uh, aircraft can't fly in that. And, but anyway, the jets did, they sent a helicopter down first and then the jets tried to fly, but because of the low ceiling, um, it was ineffective initially, but by this time we got the G squadron ready, took them down to the airport, they loaded up in choppers and went in to relieve Murbat, which was under attack by these 400 Adu, you know, firing all small arms, machine guns, and the old propelled rockets. And so w was was Murbat like an out outpost then? Was it yeah, a, it was a, a, a fort? A coastal town with a fort and a bat house where the lads lived. About eight guys in all, if my mind serves us right. And um, like I say, they was ready to come home and uh, they got attacked early morning. Uh, the two Fijians, Lubba Lubba, heroic, um, fired the gun, single-handed initially, got wounded. His mate, take of easy, a Fijian. He ran across uh, uh, open ground under intense fire. 
to help Lubber, and he got wounded. And uh, the battle went from there, and Lubber eventually got killed. And uh, Tech was seriously wounded. And um, the Jets come in, they saved the day. The, the Aru hated the Jets, but um, they really flew low as they could. Bearing in mind the reef was way down, you know, and uh, they saved the day really. And from the bat house, we had guys on the roof with um, a 50 cal browning. We had another guy firing a mortar single handed, um, open with open sights like the enemy was that close, you know. So the lads battled on, and it was the biggest battle the regiments ever faced, really. So um, under intense, um, overwhelming odds, the lads prevailed, like, you know, and held them off, and uh, we won the day. So uh, it was a magnificent um, affair, really. And Lofty, the the SES seem to have been denied a few Victoria Crosses over the years from my, my, my limited sort of, you know, understanding of things i'm very passionate about um reading up on military history i just find it so fascinating and wasn't it sergeant labba labba was mentioned in dispatches but i think the lads thought he should have had the victoria cross yeah the, the way the army was at the time like with their medals you know um you, you either uh, i've got a vc or you got a MID, you know, it was uh, one of those. And, and Lubber, like, um, he's now been, uh, they've built a statue for him in his, his home at uh, in Fiji. And they were awarded the equivalent in Fiji of the Victoria Cross, you know. Mm. So, uh, yeah, and the guy on the ground again was a guy called Keeley. He's a captain. He got, I think, a DSO from it. And another lad, like, who... Um, was a sergeant there, like he got a MM military medal. Um, but Lubber, like he could either have got the VC or the nearest thing because he died, was mentioned in dispatches, which was not reflective of, of the action that they fought. Mm. Because many said Paddy Main should have got a, a, a VC, but many apparently- times over. I mean, he got so many DSOs, but never a VC. And, um, it, they're pure polit- political, you know. I didn't know the guys, you know, but listen to everyone. They agreed he was the bravest thing on two legs, like, you know what I mean? Mm. But um, politically and um, because he was always fighting, drinking, whatever, he wasn't he wanted sort of the hierarchy's his cup of tea. And so uh, he suffered for that. Like, But, um, yeah, but the lads of Murbat, I mean, they really, they, they earned their money that day. Mm. And also... Um, something about like a VC has to be witnessed by an independent party and a lot of the sort of acts of heroism that Paddy Main did were were singular, you know, he was on his own or he might have had, you know, one oppo with him. Um, I, mean, I, th- I think you've got to have a senior rank or something, you know, but mm. who's around, you know, when you want one? And like I say, in my um, experience, like officers got decorated for doing their job which is getting mugs like us doing the work. And um, and that's how it reflects, like, you know, and there's been so many acts of heroism, you know, that goes unnoticed. And it's a soldier's job, you know, and it's lovely to add decorations, but again, sometimes um, it's, it's injustice, you know. Mm. You know, so... And so, Lofty, you, you were actually there I wasn't in Murbet. I was I was at the coast at our base in Salada, uh, okay. which is about 20 mile away, you know, and mm. um, we got the reinforcements going, you know, we got G Squadron kitted up, got them ferried down to the airport. And my boss, Duke Perry, who was the hero of Murbet in my eyes, he was my boss, the major of B Squadron. I took him down to the airport and he stayed by the control tower and he got all the information. The only communications we had with Murbat was through SOAF, the Air Force, you know, with the choppers going down and the jets. They relayed back to us. And the Duke, as we call Perry, Major Perry, you know, the Duke stayed there and he organised everything, you know, where D Squad, uh, where G Squadron were going to be deployed, what their tactics were and that. And 
when they got ferried in, like he was the man on the ground who organised it all, the relief of Murbat. And um, to me, he should have got the decorations. Like he was cool under fire, you know, brilliant. Like, and um, he, he organised he organised the relief of Murbat. And Mike Keeley, who was a captain, it, uh, have I got this right, Lofty? He died in the Bracken Beacons. He did indeed. I was running selection when he was on, when he came back to the squadron to take over D squadron. And he it was his choice that he wanted to do parts of selection again. So he volunteered to come. He didn't have to do it. He, he come back and he said he would like to do endurance march just so when he went back to the squadron, people wouldn't say, oh, he's come through the back door. Like, you know, so he actually come, I had breakfast with him in the morning, three o'clock in the morning. And we dispatched him over the hills. And um, that's he got hypothermia and he died on broken beacons. Yeah, travesty. Yeah, he's not the first. I'm, I'm guessing he won't be the last, eh? It's, um, it's, it's, you know, it's the toughest force in the world for a reason. Um, what about those three troopers that died? Were they, did they came from, was yeah, it they I'll were, the, you, they were reservists, weren't they? And, and they got, I, I don't know, heat stroke, was it? They were like, it was a summer course. And um, again, uh, three guys, one was experienced. He's been to Afghan and, uh, you know, so he had the experience, but um, you shouldn't have to tell trained soldiers water discipline. You know, we have a, a system, you know, we carry water on us all the time. The water bottle on your belt is two pints. And, um, you, don't, you drink all your other water, what you're carrying on your back, and you don't touch that water bottle until an emergency, you know. And then when you're down to that last water bottle, you know, that's when you start rationing your water. So up to then, and there's, you've got to carry the water. Now, they chose to drink things like Red Bull, you know, a performance-enhancing drink, which in time, it dehydrates you. It's meant for a short burst in the gym to give you the energy but what you need on selection is stamina and water or tea. I swear by tea, you know, when you're in doubt, mess things out, you know, make a cup of tea, make a brew, drink it as hard as you can, and it stays in the system. So when you're sweating heavily, it seems dark, but drink water, okay, it just comes straight down to pause again. You drink something hot and it stays in the system longer. Mm. And so re you stay rehydrated longer. I know it seems dark but this is how the body works, you know. Now, them guys, like I say, they perished and they was uh, part-timers and it wasn't on a, a, an SAS selection. It was Signals SAS selection. And so but yeah. the press got out all of it, make a big song and dance of it. But like I say, you should not have to tell trained soldiers water discipline. Mm. You should prepare yourself for the worst. They know selection is not going to be a walkover, so prepare for it accordingly. But like I say, they took this Red Bull or whatever, and um, it's no substitute for a good old mug of tea or water. Mm. And they or, come or, unstuck. Or a helicopter. Yeah. <laughs> you know, people either die of hypothermia, which is too much cold, or hyperthermia, too much heat. So, um, and on one ses session on... One selection, we lost a guy in the winter course, hypothermia, went to the jungle, lost a guy of hyperthermia, he ever done it, you know, heat stroke, went back on to selection and lost another guy. So um, it, it's a hard business, you know what I mean? And training, you have the saying, train hard, fight easy. It's no good sort of, um, if I want to climb Everest to go over Penny Fan, I've got to go over someone like Matt McKinley, you know, to which is a real test. And so training is hard. That's where you expect casualties. And they cannot lower the standards, Chris. You know, uh, the moment you lower standards and anyone can join, you, you're lost. You're no longer special. You know, so uh, standards are high. It is a severe test. But again, a little bit of common. If you want to do it, you do it. Preparation again. Mm. So all the time, you know, be prepared. What do we think, think then, John, about like um, – We've got the Royal Marines now is open to fe female applicants. 
I believe the special forces is two because it would be, you know, it wouldn't just be one for it would it would have to be across the board. Do we, do we have any views? Yeah, I mean, if, if women can do it, okay, but um, I don't think they will, you know. And um, the rumor went round that we had women in the regiment, and that was the fact that now and again some of the lads used to dress up. I guess you know what I mean. Especially a crate, say, in, in Northern Ireland, two blokes in the car, suspicious. So one would put a wig on or something. You know, that's how the rumour got going, I believe, you know. But women are brilliant at what they do, you know what I mean? And uh, they got specific jobs. But Karen and Bergen, you know, um, and there are women, um, they, they're they up to it now. I see women athletes, you know, the women rugby players and the boxers. You can't tell the difference, you know. So if they pass selection, okay. But uh, how they're going to get deployed, I don't know. But I wish it was back in the army, if that's the case. Lofty, we, did you serve at the same time as Serrano Fines? Yeah, he never he never joined the regiment. I, I was in the regiment when he came to selection and he took explosive from a demo course and he blew up a film set on Salisbury Plain. And um, if I had done it, I'd still be in jail. But he done it, and it was all oh, just high, high, high pranks. You know what I mean? Mm. And so um, he, he never passed selection. And he went, uh, he says uh, he was SAS. He was in the TA for a bit up in London. That's 21 SAS. But he's never regiment, you know. So um, and I, I do know the guy, you know. Mm. He's not adverse to a bit of the, the old cold weather, is he? Well, he's been up Everest, although he's got vertigo, you know. And um, mm. But, uh, yeah, he's a, a bit of a venture, like. And, uh, but, like I say, they, they're all under the guise and all saying that he's in the regiment. He was TA regiment, so uh, mm. a bit different. Lofty, did, did you personally get into many firefights? you know, or hands-on sort of stuff during your time? Because, I mean, you ended up as a warrant officer, didn't you? So you're obviously that's, you know, lead, leading men, maybe not not on the ground, so to speak, but... Yeah, you, know. you, do, you do your time, Chris, you know, I mean, uh, you, I was the youngest trooper one time, and as you as you get more rank, you go through, and, um, yeah, we have different things, and, like, it was on active service like most of the time, up to you get to an age where um, the more rank you get, obviously you become more administrative, but then you get too old for the Sabre Squadron and then you get like pushed on to going to the TA, we got uh, training wing posts, things like this, like, you know, so, mm. yeah, it's, uh, we, we've had our moments, like, you know. Did you get a few rounds down in your time? We we fight a <laughs> we fight a few, Chris. Hey. Yeah, it's the serious end of life, isn't it? Really, it's not. I, I I'm really glad. I, I only had, I had a couple of chances to shoot someone. This sounds fucking awful saying it, but I'm at the grand age now of uh, 26. I'm really glad that I, ne I bloody never did because I won't I won't want to. I think you have to be really in the right scenario not to um, do something when you're young that you have to bloody live with the rest of your life you know no you're right um, see the, the enemy we were, we were against like initially like the like the CT in Malaya and in Borneo and that uh, they wasn't they was poorly armed you know in Aden the tribesmen they poorly armed really compared with what they got nowadays you know mm. and um and so, you know, life has changed now. And when you see the battles now, what's going on? Oman was a big um, shake-up. The, the firefights there were horrendous. And every night, our positions used to get hammered. And initially, the the bad guys, the Adu, they outgunned us, in effect. They had a 12.7 uh, Sparga machine gun. It outranged our 50 cal. Uh, they had a big uh, Katushka, I think they call it, like a... Um, a big uh, mortar, and it and it outranged our um, or the seventy five recordless. That was it. That outranged our eighty one mil mortars and that. So yeah, many times we was out outranged. Uh, so uh, and their ammunition at times was 
more up to date than ours was. So, because uh, the Sultan of Oman, he bought a lot of Indian uh, ammunition, a lot of um, second hand mortar bombs, which were not very good. But the mm-hmm. British ammunition come in the, the packaging, it's um, the best. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, so yeah. it's a changing world. It's funny you should say that because I was chatting to Mick Fellows the other day on the podcast. He was, um, he's an absolutely incredible gentleman. He's got more letters after his name than the bloody alphabet, right? Because he, 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 I, I, I'm going to say this, right? He single-handedly won the Falklands. If it wasn't for him defusing the, the, the bombs that had landed on the ships, we would have lost like a whole lot more. Fantastic. And, I think it was on the um, Antrim. He's defusing this bomb and he's chatting to his commander. And he's like, boss, it's an English bomb. (laughs) He's like, how do you know it's an English bomb? He says, well, it's got made in Sheffield written on the side. (laughs) Just incredible. Incredible. Lofty, what are we? uh, No, go on, go on. Yeah, with, with a lot of the bombs that landed on the ships, they stopped defusing them in the end because that was dodgy, and they just cut the side, the plates, and rolled them out. Yeah. yeah. Rolled them overboard, you know, rather than risk defusing them. Mm. Mick Should told be, us, yeah. Mick said exactly this, you know, they made these ramps and rails and, and they just chucked them over the side and totally. and they had to have all kind of, safety procedures in place because just chucking it over the side could potentially, yeah. you know, blow the ship up. The, the jets that attacked, they was flying that low that they didn't give the bombs chance to arm themselves. You know, they've got to fall through the aircraft and there's a, a, a retardation device that operates. And if that's too low, you know, they, they don't get chance to fuse the bomb. Until the BBC told the Argentines. Yeah. That was the case, and then they changed the fuse, and That's yes, yeah, uh, oh gosh, press again, mm. yeah. Lofty, what? How was your feelings um, when all the sort of Bravo Two Zero stuff came out? Yeah, Any- I mean, you know, I read the book, I love the book, but um, it's a work of fiction, but makes good reading, and um, yeah, there you go. He's, he's made a living from it, so. Uh, yeah, but like I say, it's all good fiction. Yeah, I was, it, it had a bit of an effect on me because Bob Consiglio, who was in the Bravo 2 Zero Patrol, Aye. was a fellow Marine. He was, yeah, yeah. We, we used to good say, guy. yeah, we used to say he was the first Marine to join the SA. Apparently, that's not true, but that's no, what no, we. No, 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 no. We have, we have before that. Mm, yeah. But we thought that because he actually had to leave the bootnecks to go to Civvy Street then apply to join the army to, to do selection. Cause it wasn't combined back then. And, and, um, and I remember um, I was on my parachute course and I shared a room with two troopers, two friends at home, SAS troopers, um, Nige. And I won't say the other guy's name cause it's a nickname and everyone will know who I'm talking about. But they said to me, Chris, do you know, Bob Consiglio? And I was like, well, not, like personally, but everybody in the core knows Bob because he's like joined the SAS and, and our, our parachute course lofty was canceled like the next day. Cause all the Herks had to go out to the Gulf and I got a lift back down to Plymouth with two, um, two nine commando lads. And they dropped me off at, I think it's my dad's place. And I went in, I chucked m- my Bergen to one side, put the telly on and bloody hell, there was a coffin coming out of a church somewhere, I don't know, let's just say up north, with a, a union flag on it. And the newsreader says, today the people of such and such village buried the body of trooper Bob Consiglio, the first casualty of the Gulf War. I'd just been talking about him with his mates the day before, Lofty, you know? Uh, tragic, tragic. Uh, yeah. Um, Castaway, that was a program that had some, quite a big impact on TV. Was it, was it like 30 people on a remote Scottish island? 
That's it. Yeah. And you were, what, 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 were, you, were you the advisor on that, Lofty? That's it. It was uh, the millennium, like 2000. And um, yeah, these guys had to go on to um, Terence, a remote island up by Stornoway, Scotland there. And um, they was given lots of stuff, right? And they had to stay there for the year. I had no idea how to make cemental bread. <laughs> I can do both. Might get them muddled up sometimes. <laughs> so they... they they had they had um, bashes and that, and they made polytunnels. They had to grow veg, rear their animals, um, use local resources, and, and survive for the year. So, mm. and it was an experiment in people getting on with each other. And it's like when you select people uh, and you're trying to select them for certain things, it goes astray. You know, they spent thousands trying to get the the right mix of people, where I would have just got. You know, 30 people off the street I wouldn't want to interview them because they would interreact and that'd be more interested than trying to coach or to guide people to how you think they're going to behave you know and uh, to me um, uh, I couldn't get my hands around it I couldn't get my head around it really who they selected in the end but um, they had a doctor there who uh, they would have been better off with a um a good a, a paramedic, you know, someone who's seen action and everything, because the doctor's good at sitting in the surgery writing um, sick notes out and that, but you want a guy hands-on who can deal with trauma. Mm -hmm. And a lot of GPs are not used to that, you know, so that was my biggest thing. And um, But putting a doctor on the island, everyone would be knocking on his door saying, I'm not very well, have you got this? You know what I mean? So to me, a big mistake. So, you know, they... Um, I come out with my comments, and um, but the BBC, in their wisdom, they chose to do what they wanted, you know. Mm. And and it was a bit of a, a chaos to start. A lot of them refused to go on the island because um, the accommodation wasn't ready. Well, they're so lucky to have accommodation, you know. There's a lot of stuff there, and they could have built their own, you know. But it was a big program, big budget, and that. But um, I done all the training to help select the the, the eventual. I think you're, you're right saying 30 people, but, um, you know, they, they had to have a butcher, someone who knew about farms, um, you know, farming and stuff like that. So it was a good cross-section, and um, they all had to get together. But the trouble is they gave them booze. And you know what it's like, Chris? The moment you give people booze, confined area, you you got all the strife, all the, all the drama you want in the world, like, you know. Yeah, and half a, of it, the, the you can't it, film. Yeah, light the touch paper. There you go. <laughs> hey, I I stayed on an island the other day. Actually, I was um, part of an upcoming expedition that I'm undertaking. I did a training exercise for it's three or four days on an island down in Cornwall, and I was, you know, I'm always in the survival mind frame. It's just the way my mind works i'm thinking could could you live here i'll tell you what i found food wise was the samphire grass that was all over the island and that's really really tasty samphire in the water even though it was cold you wouldn't want to stay in there more than you know five five or ten minutes but the mussels were so big. I'd never seen them so big in the UK because because it was an untouched island. Nobody goes there. They hadn't been picked. It was really big. Each mussel had such a big bit of meat in it. It was incredible. In uh, one of the guys put put his wetsuit on, and in about twenty minutes, I think he he managed to collect about five or six spider crabs. And they, they went down well. Um, there was bird life on the island, but of course, being conservationists, we stayed well away from it. But of course, you know, in a survival situation, you you that that's obviously another option, eggs and 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 birds. You, you know what you you know what your big problems are, right, Chris? Trying to find an uninhabited island anywhere in the world. Mm. The reason islands are not inhabited is there's no water. Yeah. And your big problem, I guess, even in Cornwall, we looked everywhere on us to do this program. And 
without water, you're, you're snookered. Mm. Unless you've got vast amounts of fuel and you can desalinate the um, the sea, you're in, you're in trouble and you can't depend on the rain. So did you have any water on the island? Well, we took obviously took water with us, but I get, Jolly. You, you know, you, 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 you bang on Lofty. Uh, you'd have to rely on trying to catch rainwater when it came. But actually, it's Cornwall, so it <laughs> comes quite a lot. But, <laughs> yeah, um, but never when you need it. Yeah. But there was also, um, uh, comes to mind is I've watched, is it called the Island with, with, with your best buddy, Bear Grylls? Yeah. And it's whenever they find the water, it's pretty obvious that the film crew have built that water pit and filled it. You, you can actually see like where they've studied the rocks in to make it look natural. Hey, Credit to Bear, they do actually say now some of these scenes have been created to, you know, some of these, surely, surely. you know, yeah. and so, so I'm not, I'm, I'm not being disrespectful here. Uh, um, no. Is it Colonel Grills now? I think he's Colonel in, 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 in the Royal Marines now, on honorary Colonel. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, you're quite right. You're quite right. I think, do you think digging? What would you do, Lofty? Would you find a cliff and then dig underneath it and figure like the waters maybe, you know, come, uh, not, not a cliff, but, you know, a, 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 a yeah, hill or whatever and dig at the bottom of it and, and hope hope to get something? Well, go, go above the high water mark, you know, it, and um, especially like behind sand dunes, you know, but go inland a bit yeah. and dig down away from the... Um, the, the sort of the, the coast, the water's edge, mm. and dig down below the water line, and you might find water there by the time the salt water has, has percolated through the earth. It might be more palatable, or any rainwater will be caught there. But like you say, the, if there's any underground water, people would inhabit the island and they could do, dig down for wells and that, you know what I mean? But it's got to have a natural source. And that's why islands are not inhabited. You know what I mean? Yeah. So certain times of the year, like you say, dependent on rain, people, you know, they go there to farm during, say, maybe the monsoon, this is in the tropics, but the rest of the year, no water, so no one lives there, you know. Mm -hmm. And around all these islands, when we've done some filming, uh, the first film we made was uh, in 1985, I think. We looked for an island to um, take six people on, three men, three women, and trying to find an island, it was impossible. And we finished up on Ramsey. Ramsey Island just off St. David said in Wales. But there was a, a couple living on that. There's a small harbour there, and um, they had a house established. But we had to keep that out of the shop and um, get the survivors on the other side of the island. But So you 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 got to cheat for like... Yeah. Um, and to make it interesting, if you're doing a survival sort of thing on an island, if you're on top of everything, there's no dramas because you're you're anticipating what's going to happen and, you, and you've got a contingency plan for that. And so everything goes smoothly. And that's how you run a survival situation from good leadership, forward thinking. So it's like watching paint dry if they make a series like that and there's no drama. So... What the BBC do, they always pick a troublemaker, they always pick maybe a pretty girl, and they always want someone argumentative, so they start mixing it. And all they want to see is failure and people falling out. Now, this island we've done on Ramsey, I had to train these people in Exeter first and then take them to the island. They didn't know where they were, and their, their mission was to get off the island. And the producers wanted failure because it, it makes more drama and all the rest, going behind people's backs. But we actually built a raft. And instead of going between Ramsey and the mainland, which was going past a line of rocks called the Bitches, where the tide was racing in between all the time, it would just wreck you, stood no chance. I went the other side of the island and went out to the shipping lanes where all the ships going up to Milford Haven. And... Um, we put a raft out there and it was picked up by an aircraft and we successfully got a rescue, you know. 
But the producer had been to the mainland for a conflap, and when he came back, it was all over. We'd been rescued, and I never see him again. I think he committed suicide, you know, because he wanted failure. That helicopter behind me is the last helicopter which will take off and end the project that was Castaway 2000. I've only been on the island of Taranse for two days, but in that short period of time, I've picked up the sense of excitement and drama that these remarkable people have been through. But mm. like I say, I just want peace and quiet. I want everything to run smoothly. I don't want dramas. You can easily get them. You know what I mean? I want a quiet life. So um, that's what the survivors is all about to me, you know, avoiding all these dramas, you know, forward planning and, mm. like I say, uh, anticipation. You know, I mean, stopping things going wrong or deteriorating before there's no going back, you know. So by lighting the fire, you're supplementing calories. As soon as you can, light your candle. Once you've got your candle lit, you can get a fire going. Now, you don't use a lot of the candle. I'll just let that burn. With no wind blowing, I'll use a very, very small amount of that, OK? Now, fire triangle, remember? You need fuel. We've got lots of fuel. You need heat, there's a candle, you need oxygen. Are you familiar, Lofty, with the, the concept? We learned, I, I learned this at uni because I did social sciences and it's talking about group formation and they call it, uh, uh, hang on, forming, storming, as in arguing, norming, as in like coming together as a team, and performing it one of the things even though the these a lot of these shows these days are pretty sensational like you say you know they, they it's more about the gossip and the having some i don't know left-wing rastafarian lesbian dwarf to just upset the apple cart but it. what they do get really well is the way that groups come together learn each other's strengths and weaknesses and learn to accept them. And then, you know, they always end up quite happy, don't they, on these programmes, that they've really achieved something that that they ne otherwise never would have. Well, you know, I ain't got a bit of paper to me known, Chris, you know, but, I, you know, it's um, dealing with people. You meet people and you can see, like, and you give them a little task to do. You see way up people. And you're on about that castaway programme. The BBC, they paid a thousand pound per person to be psychologically looked at, you know, for suitability for the island. Mm -hmm. Well, all these people come and I used to say, yeah, they're okay, she's good, he's not, and all that. And they had a woman psychiatrist who interviewed them all and she said, Lofty, how come you can pick this out and this? It's, it's, it's common sense, Chris, you know what I mean? And it's, um, experience i guess mm. and they spent all this money doing these psychological profiles i couldn't believe it and you know you know yourself who you like with you and like say on selection i used to ask myself would i have that bloke in my patrol and that was good enough do i ever say yes or no you know what i mean mm. and um you don't have to go to all these um like fancy formulas and all the rest of it and tests and it's like cvs um, when people show CVs, you know, you think, oh, they're brilliant, you know. Get them to do a practical thing, useless. And so I, I scrabble around that, you know. I just see the guy face to face, have a chat to him, give him a task to do and um, and see how they perform, you know. And you can eliminate all this bullshit, really, you know. Yes, of course, of course. As I'm getting older, John, I'm... Um... It's, it's all about the ego for me now. I, I, I realise if I work with people that are in their ego self, it fucking never ends well, you know? Oh, right. You've got to be maturer than that. You know, you've got to love people and love life. and, and, and Be not, your own not, person, Chris. Yeah, That's yeah, thing, you know. Yeah. I'll tell you an interesting thing. So I had an email recently, Lofty, right? And uh, it's from a chap who's written a book. He never got back to me, by the way, but he emailed, say, could he, <laughs> could he come on a podcast? And a book he's written is called, it's called something like The Phony Major, and it's about David Sterling. Oh, right. I okay. see I see an article in the paper. 
uh, it was the first I'd ever heard that there could be anything hooky. I, I, I haven't read the book, folks. The guy didn't. I, I, I said to him, look, send me a copy. I'll have a look. Yeah, you, you know, if there's anything in it, you're welcome to come on the show. We're all about openness and honesty and truth. Yeah. Didn't, re- didn't, didn't reply to me, so I don't know where You've that chap's been gone. assassinated, I would say, Chris. He probably had been kicked in the nuts by Hereford. <laughs> yeah, no, I read that and I thought, I never heard that before. You know, uh, Sterling was the man, he's the visionary. He's one who started it all, you know, so. Yeah. And uh, I don't know where the guy got his information from, but there you go. Every, yeah. Don't matter who you are, you're going to have your critics, so. Yeah, I haven't read it, John. I'll be, I mean, I'll be no. interested to see what he's, Maybe you can. I can probably glean something on Amazon about what it's supposed to be about. But yeah. uh, I didn't. I, I I thought I'd run that by you. Um, Jock Lewis. He was a big big name, wasn't he? Back in the early formation. Jock Lewis. In, yeah. Uh, yeah. Jock Lewis. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. And was it round about that time? I've, I've just been reading a bit, and they they had a parachute jump in the early training. And the first two blokes that went out, that the, the stag line wasn't fixed yeah. on right. They, they had lots of fatalities, and they jumped in high winds, which was um, into desert with the ground is solid, you know, and a uh, lot of fatalities. Mm. And it was like Malaya tree jumping again, dangerous. So, in the jungle, didn't they jump into the trees? And yeah, tree jumping. Yeah, yeah. and then and they had a. Sell- the abseil device was fatal, called a bikini, and it was a friction device that, like, like a bikini bottoms, you know, and the tape went through a ring around this and uh, a descender, and it was it was lethal. If it wasn't fitted right, the ring went up under the diaphragm and blokes, the pain was that much, they cut themselves free. And, again, you're talking about 200-foot canopy, and they fell that sort of distance, you know, and in the trees with no sort of um, backup, no possibility of getting out, you know, for a long time or medical help. And uh, that's why they're parachuting in the trees, like, you know what I mean? So, yeah, dangerous. And looking was- back, Chris, I realised how brave I was. Yeah, you can say that again, Lofty, you know, I mean, it's one thing to go through training now where health and safety has just been, it's a fight. I mean, in the Marines, we still lost a lot of people, you know, we lost people in Norway. A lot of it was road at, you know, road accidents or people falling asleep in the snow vehicle and the, and the fumes poisoning them at, 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 you you know, still lose a lot of people. But as far as the health and safety is, you know, it's bloody shit up. Yeah. But back in 1945 or 39, it was all, there was no such thing, was there? They, they were, they were make they were inventing everything that we see today. Chris, now with health and safety and politically correctness, no way I couldn't operate. It's easy as that, you know, it's, um, we, we was always on thin ice took a lot of chances and um, we didn't have the kit or the equipment, but now it's, um, it's so clinical. And like you said, we still get casualties and that is, that is, it's a dangerous profession and it will never change. Mm. You can't take all the dangers away. Uh, the Yanks try to make their life comfortable, you know, and uh, take all the hardships away. You can't do it. It's a hard profession and, you know, the people are going to be up to it. But I think it's still not as dangerous as what is it? Fishing, uh, tra- trawlermen and lumberjacks. <laughs> yeah, I mean, fishermen, you take it. There's nothing more powerful than the sea. And um, no. They're odd men, mine, aren't they? Yeah, they're miners, odd. Coal miners, you know, people mm-hmm. like that, you know, fantastic. And in all yeah. the professions in the forces, to me, the bravest of the brave are the cooks, you know, and they, they all they get is criticised and hammered, yet they do a fantastic job and um, it goes unrewarded, you know, and I could never be a cook, Chris. Mm. So every man to his trade, you know, but we couldn't have survived without all the backups. 
And like I say, when you read about all these heroes, the heroes to me were the, your pay blokes, the cooks, the bottle washers, you know what I mean? But they they done all the hard work, which I couldn't have done. We had the glamorous side of it, you know, and we got all the recognition and that. But, you know, I take me out of to all the supporting um, arms, like, you know, they are the heroes as well, you know. And it, when you start picking out, okay, who the heroes are, I would go for people like that. You know, it's the cleaners, like they do a great job, which not a lot of people could do, you know. Yes. It's changing now, though, Lofty, because I said this quite a lot. Like, I got massive respect for, obviously, my experience was Royal Marine chefs, Royal Navy chefs, being on ship. Those guys were just so brilliant to you, especially if you're in the Marines detachment. They they cook you up little, you know, secret stuff <laughs> little oh, yeah. snacks uh, now, and but the, the food i mean everyone looked forward to meal time it, it wasn't like being in prison or somewhere it's just slop no this is the finest the raw marine chefs best if you ask me best chefs in 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 the world and i'm sure every service will will say the same that's good now though mate it's all this like um contracts con yeah. yes Yes. Contracts. And it's Trying to get the money down. Yeah, it's crap. It's shit. You go to Limston now, you eat yeah. off a paper plate. <laughs> uh, shit, it's gone down. It's gone down here a lot, Chris. Ah, yeah. oh, God, we just, how we miss the small things in life, you know, the small things that make you what you are. And we just think, ah, oh, just give that up to money, you know, profit. Paper plate, chuck it in a bin. No, um, pl plastic knife and fork, chuck that. It, Disposable. Ah, ah. But in in the Middle East, Chris, we had cooks with number one burners. You know the old number one burner. It, it was it was the first weapon of mass destruction, really. <laughs> and he burned so many cooks. We had so many cooks. They burnt medium rare. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> it was petrol, and they wouldn't let it cool down before trying to to refuel it. But they produced magic meals in the middle of nowhere. Number one burner. And we, we ate like fighting cocks, real good, you know, good, good grub, like, you know. When we did our survival exercise in training, Lofty, right, we, we went up to a beautiful place up near Post Bridge in Dartmoor. And uh, we arrived last. By the time we got there, all the other lads, they found caves, like these like wicked little caves and they had their fires going. It was like luxury, right? Me, me and my oppo, we built a basher. As you taught me to, Lofty, right? We built a basher on a fallen uh, fallen tree stump. And I remember our troop boss come round and he went, hmm, not so nice as the other lads' accommodation, boys. <laughs> but we had our little fire going in there. We had our rabbit that we had to keep and then we had to eat it. But here's the thing, right? My buddies, um, funny enough, Andy and Andy, that they, they hired a car the weekend before, went to Tesco, filled the boot with Ginster's pasties and Mars bars and marathons and <laughs> all Snickers, right? They drove down to Devon the week before because one of the lads, Andy, was in, he'd been in, he'd got to, he'd done this before in training. He, he got to week 24, left training rejoined with our troop and went through it all again. And when we got to the survival X, he's like, guys, I know where it is. What we're going to do, we're going to fill the car with food and we'll go down and bury it. <laughs> right. And so that's exactly what they did. And one night they went, right, we're going for the food. And for some reason, it was like quite a few miles away. They'd got something wrong. But anyway, they, 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 they came back and I paid 70 quid, right? I got against this pasty in a Mars bus <laughs> for my 70 quid. <laughs> they spent, the, right, mo they spent hey. the money on a weekend in Birmingham, I think it was, right? But, yeah. but we had that. And also inside the waistband of my boxer shorts, I, I, I put a tenner. And there was a shop that you could sneak to nearby if, as long as you didn't get caught. Anyway, we did all get caught. The training team walked past one of the bashers and there was 
like a, a Twix wrapper or something on the floor. Yeah. Next thing, we was all in the river. It's September, which doesn't sound cold, but oh my God, September the 21st, my birthday. It was the coldest thing I have ever, way colder than Norway. It, it was awful, right? Under the water, up under the water. You want to eat food on exercise? Under the water. <laughs> but the, getting back to your point about the old burner, right? Our training team thought they'd be really kind and make us what they called survival X stew for the end of the exercise. Right. So after seven days, you know, living on moss and they thought, they thought we'd all be gagging to, to just scoff this bloody. Sh but like you said, they burnt the hell out of it. Right. They literally, it just tasted like charcoal. <laughs> Right. And because everyone was so full up from all the food that we bought, <laughs> everyone's like, now nah, we're we're fine, Corporal. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we're the only people that came off of survival exercise actually put on weight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Lofty, two, two more things. Yeah, mate. What do we think of the SAS Who Dares Wins program? Do, do we watch any of that? Yeah, I, I, I watch a couple for curiosity. I don't watch it all the way through. Mm. Yeah, the lads like they're making a living, you know, and um, it's sensationalism. It's it's as far away from the reality of, of what the regiment really is. It don't represent me at all or what I stand for. You know what I mean? But no. there you go, the lads making a living, and it's people's choice. It's what it's what people want. That's why they're getting away with it because. It's popular, and like I say, if you don't want to watch it, just switch off. That's what I'm saying, Chris, you know. And um, the people do want to know about the regiment, and unfortunately it shows you in the wrong light. This is why I take the opportunity, if I can, like with myself, to try and put things a bit, you know, um, give it, give my point of view, you know what I mean? And um, But I, I, I think it's... Um, if people want to watch it, that's, you know, it's down to them, but it doesn't represent the regiment that I was in. Yeah. I, I, I think people kind of get that unless they're, you know, pretty naive. Um, what I, what I, I mean, Ollie Ollerton, who's a, a star of the show, or certainly he's the star of the Australian version. Now he's been on a podcast. He's a really nice guy. Yeah. Um, funny enough, they're mostly SBS, aren't they? There's stuff. I think yeah. Billy Billy Bill, Billingham is um is is sass and uh, yeah, a couple of yeah. but what I, what I really like is when they help people and that that to me was my exp the, the best part of being in the British forces is that seeing someone struggling but they're not giving up camaraderie you can't beat it Chris yeah, yeah. sure you, you've got to encourage people you know. What I'm against the shows are they, they're testing people on skills, what they're not taught them. Before you can test anyone, you've got to teach them. Then you can test them and then you can criticise. But these people straight from Civil Street, you know, getting out of helicopters, falling backwards into water. I would never do that, Chris. We say never enter water head first, you know, never jump in the water unless you are absolutely got to. And it's always feet first, you know, it's... Um, Going off backwards like that, it's suicidal, you know, and some of the abseils they're doing, it takes a lot of skill to do them abseils, you know, running down a mountain, you know, face first, you know, things like this. And um, I know it's all done for telly like, but like I say, it's um, it's your choice to watch it or not. Um, you, you can all, all, we're all highly critical. Like I say, don't, we'll always find fault with things. And so, um, oh, you know, we was always better than the, the people we replaced. You know what I mean? And we have the saying there, the older I get, the better I was. And um, and so it's all hype. It's done for the telly. Uh, it, it's there by popular demand and people watch it. So they're doing something right. But like I say, the people who know or the ex-regiment and that, they um, frown on it a bit, you know. Yeah, of course, of course. I, I like to look at the good stuff that comes from it because I, I know I've, I've met vicariously or, or actually in person all, all the guys on it, well, except Billy. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, very, very nice, very nice men, you know. Um, 
and I think Foxy needs a big shout out because he he was really one of the first people to talk about PTSD. Good and, boy, yeah. You know, and tell his story, yes. and 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 um, Ollie's up there. I don't know what I don't know where Ollie's base is, but he's he's helping people that never join the forces, but they wanted that experience to you oh. know go go on a weekend with him or a week or a training just to get their confidence confidence up and. Yeah, a lot Excellent. of people in life, Lofty Dam, they've never achieved anything, have they? You know, no. never achieved anything, and and um, so I think it's good credit to the to you know, good 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 credit to Ollie with what he's doing. Yeah, put something back. That's what you know. It's nice when people do that. Mm. And the thing we all have to remember is the military's. Some people are lucky enough to have pensions. I I'm certainly not. Um, I don't think I served long enough. My back is absolutely screwed from my time in the Marines and they won't give me a, <laughs> they won't give me a penny. Right. So I think if you can use your military service to the Chris, good, I'm, I'm on an army pension and I worked out what the army owe me. I've got a little 158 years old. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's my world to live as well. And I'm not going to be cheated by a penny. Yes. <laughs> So you didn't get a pension, Chris? No. Oh, mate, I've got nothing. I, I've, I've literally, I'm. You could say I'm disabled. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm in yeah, chronic yeah. pain. I, I, this is why, whenever I'm on my, whenever you see me do this, it's because the pain in my back's too much. Sorry. I can't just lift myself up a bit. And, but, but why, why didn't you get a pension, Chris? You know, you um, got hurt on duty. No, the reason was is you had to report it to the sick bay, right? All right. Well, yeah. here's the thing, Lofty, and I'm not, I'm not, this is not like match your bullshit. Or no. I grew up in a time you didn't fucking report stuff to the doc. You no, didn't run right. to the doctor. Uh, you know, if right. you, you had a bad back, you went home, you took some paracetamol, you laid on the couch and you struggled yeah. into work. The next. So I never reported, you know, I never reported it. And um, <coughs> it, I could probably get lawyers onto or something, but I, I'm not, I, I don't care yeah. about that. I, I, I just think keep smashing life and life will, you know, give you good stuff back. I'm not, I'm not bothered about a minute military pension. Um, well, in my case, Chris, I, um, I wanted to get a five year extension. So I burnt me medical docs and, uh, that was great. I got me five year extension, but then when you start want to claim against things, you got no evidence. Yes, <laughs> I got so exactly. it. It's a funny old world. Yeah, uh, exactly. Lofty, very last thing I want to talk to you about is right, my fa favorite thing in it. My, my favorite course I ever did was parachuting the, yeah, yeah. Up, up there at Bryce yeah. Norton. Did, did you do that one or did you do in, in your day was the, there, there all this specialist, Hey, ho, yeah. Halo I started, stuff. I started me para, basic para course with the paras at Abingdon. And then, um, I was on the second free fall course when, when I come to regiment, the second free fall course, that the um, the army run, and I was two troop, which was three full troop in um, A squadron, and then in '66 we won the army championships. This is a regiment, we was the only free fallers in the country, and we had the SAS skydivers. It was a, a display team. I was a member of, it, of that as well for a bit, you know, and uh, we we went into the nationals uh, and the regiment or the parachute regiment. You know, a few jumpers. Uh, with them, used to win it all, you know, so that was my life, parachuting. And now you mention it, um, I've now got more courage. It would take me 10 blokes to put me in the aircraft and another 20 to throw me out, Chris. But when I was on my basic course, um, I was more frightened of refusing, you know, facing up to the um, instructor's then I was jumping out the door. To me, the coward's option was jumping out the door, like. And I remember Bryce Norton, big sign, sorry, at Abingdon, knowledge dispels fear. That's the, the para training school motto. I must have been the thick as anything because I was terrified, Chris. But, you know, <laughs> like I say, in the end, we was paying for our jumps, you know what I mean? Like free fall, like later on, you know. So it's all down to training, you know, what you, what you, what you want to do, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, mate, I was in that balloon cage with three baby paras. 
no disrespect yeah, yeah. folks we call they, they called themselves baby parrots right they just graduated would have got their berries bloody good effort um so i'm in that balloon cage and there's three baby parrots with me and the the pji the parachute jump instructor says right who's first out the door <laughs> you can imagine my how, how fast my arm went up <laughs> so, uh, um i got in the door he said, arms across your reserve. I oh, just turned around and went, I'll see you guys on the ground. <laughs> <You're on the ball! laughs> when, I, when I caught up with him on, on, on the ground, Dun Duncan, if you ever get to watch this, get in touch with me. He was a, a, love, a, a great lad, para lad that I made real good friends with. Uh, I got on the ground. I said, Dunk, what did you think when I was like, I'll see you guys on the ground? He went, uh, actually, Chris, we're all just like fucking shitting ourselves. I didn't really hear you. <laughs> <laughs> no, good luck. They don't. They don't do the balloon no more, do right, Chris? Oh, mate, they don't. They don't. Uh, no more balloon jumps. They do some sort of caravan, you know, Cessna caravan kind of, you know, yeah. or sc sky van, I think they call it. And and the new um, replacement of the Hercules aircraft, they cannot do static line jumps from because of the prop wash, apparently. So. Uh. Uh, I don't know where I don't know what we're coming to, mate. I was going to say, yeah, that's, that's screwed up all our bloody post-war history, isn't it? <laughs> it's yeah. going to be no, was it Arnhem again? <laughs> yeah, uh, this is a glory. Yeah. Oh, oh, I love that course, Lofty. I really loved it. I, when I was in the Herc, I used to hang around at the when they were when they were loading in the sticks. I always would just hang around and then tag on the back because then I knew I knew I'd be first out the door. First out the door, yeah. <laughs> and well, we uh, I used to scream so loud going out the door. It, <laughs> folks, you're not supposed to do this, but I um the 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 guy behind me thought I died. <laughs> <laughs> he said, Chris, you scream so loudly, right? I mean, like a Viking warrior scream, not 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 a sissy one, folks. Uh, he said, "Chris, I thought you died, <laughs> and I didn't want to jump out." <laughs> yeah, Absolutely we brilliant. we used to like going to RAF stations because they had knives and forks, cups on the table, they had butter, and it was so civilized. And that's why we like going to the RAF. The food was excellent, you know. Yeah, the way I think of it is. Their fighter jets and their bombs and everything are so expensive that that to take a bit off that budget for the food is like nothing for them. Think, uh, you know, it's like nothing. And 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 one missile, yeah. Oh my god, it was good, wasn't it? It was, it was yes. um, like five star food for the RAF. <laughs> yeah, Lofty. Listen, I could chat for for, for ages, but what I'd rather do is invite you back on again at at, at you know some later stage. Um, I, I thoroughly enjoyed this catch up. I yes, I on. think I think we've hit a few of the ticked a few of the boxes for everybody at home. Um massive, massive stay on the line, Lofty, after I hit the off button and I, I, I and then I can thank you properly. And also I was gonna I was gonna try and borrow twenty quid off you if that's okay. Yeah. Um it's in the post, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> but no, Lofty, massive love to you and your wonderful family. Uh, please take care of yourself. Thank you for being a legend to, to so, so, so many of us. Thank you for your service, which is not something you'll hear me say very, very often, but I, I, I do genuinely mean it. Um, let's chat again soon. And to everybody at home, much love to you too. I, you, mate. I hope you've enjoyed this as, uh, as much as I have. And uh, we'll take see care, you soon. Chris. Thank you, mate.